Story time on how I found out my dad was transgender. Also, by the way, at the time I was 12. So I grew up an only child. I always wanted siblings, but my parents said that I was enough. And we would never really go see family like my grandparents. When I was a toddler, I used to see them. Well, at least that's what my parents told me. But I was never close with any of my family besides my one aunt. So one day I had a sleepover and I invited my friend and we played hide and seek. And I spent like 10 minutes looking for her until I finally found her in my basement holding a book. I was like, girl, I'm done playing with you. And she said she found an old picture book. When she told me, I was kind of excited because I haven't seen much of my family. As we went through the book, I saw a picture of my grandparents and two little girls. One of the girls in the picture I knew was my aunt because of the mole, but I didn't know who the other girl was. I flipped the picture around and it said familia, which by the way is family in Spanish. And I was like, so there's another aunt that I don't know about? But if you want to know how I confronted my dad about it, Come back for part two. This is part two on how I found out my dad was transgender. So like I said, I found a picture of my dad's family, but he wasn't in it. That night I went to my parents' bedroom and I saw my mom. I showed her the picture and she gasped. I asked, do I have another aunt and where's dad? She told me to sit down and that they wanted to tell her, but they wanted to wait at an age where they think I'd understand. So a couple minutes later, my dad walked in and I asked, who's this girl? He said next to me, held my shoulders and said that was him. And I started laughing at first because I was like, you're not a little girl. And he responded, at that time, that was me. And from there, he just told me everything to when he finally transitioned. He talked about how unaccepting my grandparents were, which is partially why I really don't go see them. After everything my dad told me, I just sat there and cried for him. And my mom and dad both held me and told me everything was going to be fine. It's been nine years and I have so much more respect for my dad, no matter what anyone thinks. How I escaped human trafficking. So one day I went to the mall with two of my best friends, Mackenzie and Dylan, and my sister Judy. At the time we were 14, 15, and we were getting prepared for high school, so we were looking for the latest outfits. In the middle of us the shopping, there was an older woman that came up to us and said that we looked really pretty. Her name was Miss Dream because she made dreams come true. Well, that's what she told us at least. Miss Dream said that she was a photographer for Vogue, and she showed us pictures of her and Tyra Banks. At that time, I was really into that show, America's Next Top Model, and I loved Tyra. She asked that once we got done shopping, if we could go to the back of the mall and take photos. She said she was thinking of getting us on a magazine. We were so hyped that we literally loved that moment to take the photos. She starts taking pictures of us, and then she gets Judy by herself. While taking pictures, six guys walked up. They picked up my best friends, and when I saw this, I yelled at Judy and told her to run. I ran for maybe 15 seconds before I was caught too and everything went black. Come back for part two. Part two on how I escaped human trafficking. So there was this guy, they walked up to us and he picked up my two best friends. Both me and my sister tried to run, but before I tried to get away, everything turned black. When I woke up, I don't know how much time went by, but I think we were all like on a pickup truck. My friends and Judy were all asleep and there were a few other girls piled up on each other. I got up and tried to wake them up. Judy woke up and asked where we were and I told her I, I didn't know. Judy quickly woke up Mackenzie. When Mackenzie sat up, she said she didn't feel well. I asked her what was wrong and she literally throws up on me. And that had to be the most disgusting day because it smells so bad. But at that moment, I wasn't upset because we didn't know where we were. When Judy tried to wake up Dylan, she wouldn't get up. Judy shook her probably 50 times and she wouldn't wake up. Then she looks at me, bends down and says that she's not breathing. And I tell her, no, she's okay. She's right there. Judy starts crying and says, no, she's not breathing. After this, it gets really gruesome. I'm letting you guys know that so you can swipe up before the next part. Come back for part three. Story time about the guy who pretended to be transgender to get into the girl's bathroom. So we're going to go ahead and call him Danny. And at the time I knew of Danny, but I didn't really know him. We weren't friends or nothing like that. Danny was known as the gay guy, he would always have his makeup done, and he would hang out with some of the girls. Everything was fine and cool until we entered our junior year and Danny came out as transgender. He started wearing wigs and dressing more feminine-like. Now when he would get dressed up, he would look completely different than what he looked like as his, you know, born male self. You would think that he was a different person when he would get dressed up. Well, one particular day, he didn't get dressed up, and he entered the girl's bathroom. 
when he did that, all of a sudden, it was a big group of girls running out of the bathroom screaming. If you guys want to know why they ran out, come back for part two. This is part two of the guy that pretended to be transgender to get into the girl's bathroom. So, like I said before, junior year was the year Danny came out as transgender. Some days he'd get dressed up, some days he didn't. When he entered the girl's bathroom, a group of girls ran out of the bathroom screaming. I think maybe a couple hours later after lunch, Danny was called to the office and rumors went around about Danny trying to look through the girl's stalls. One girl claimed that he was peeking through the stall to look at one of her friends and Danny was suspended. I think two weeks later, Danny came back to school and she completely stopped wearing feminine type outfits. That same week, me and my friend Kenneth were walking past the boys' bathroom and we heard a lot of fumbling going on. I told him to go check what was going on. When he checked, there was a group of guys in the bathroom jumping Danny. I'm running out of time. Come back for part three. Part three of the guy that pretended to be transgender to get into the girl's bathroom. So, like I said earlier, Danny was in the bathroom and he was getting jumped by a group of guys. After it was over, he walked out last and he walked over to his locker. So, I followed him to see if he was okay and he had a black eye and his lip was busted. I asked him if he wanted me to walk him to the nurse and why did they even jump him? Danny replied, the guy said I'm not allowed into their bathrooms anymore. He said anytime he ever entered there, he'd get bullied or teased for being gay. Then I asked him, I thought you were transgender. He said he said that because he didn't want to go into the guy's bathrooms anymore. I said, what about the incident about you peeking through the girl's stalls? He said, I never looked through any other girl's stall. I was just seeing to see who was in the bathroom so I could go in. He said, I'm gay. I don't even like girls. And it wasn't my intentions to make anyone uncomfortable. Come back for part four. When I was younger, I grew up with a cut on my face. It went down from my cheekbone all the way down to my neck. It was very long, the longest cut anyone has ever seen. When I was in school, teachers and students would ask, how did I get that cut or if it still hurt? I would tell them it didn't hurt, but I didn't know where the cut came from. My mom actually told me I was born with it. Some teachers would say, that doesn't look like a cut you were born with. I think when I got a little older to understand, I asked my mom again, how did I get this cut on my face? She'd say, as usual, you were born with it. But I don't know, I just had a feeling there was something she wasn't telling me. If I could, I'd ask my dad, but my mom told me that he passed away a couple weeks after I was born. When I turned 18, I finally went to the dermatologist to see what was up with this cut. They told me the cut looked as though someone cut me with a sharp object. Later that week, I went to my aunt's house and told her about my dermatologist visit. She broke down in tears and started apologizing. Come back for part two. So after going to the dermatologist about the cut I had on my face my entire life, I went to my aunt about it and she broke down and cried. She apologized and told me that I needed to speak to my mom. She said she thought it would be best if she told me. So I went home a bit confused and I talked to my mom. I told her the dermatologist told me the cut on my face wasn't from something I was born with. My mom looked at me and said, I never told you because I didn't want you to feel bad about this, this family, your father, but... When you were three weeks old, your dad did this to you. I said, what? What do you mean? He did this to me? Why? She replied, your dad was really sick. I cried and asked, why would he do this? She looked at me and said that he tried to get rid of you. We couldn't afford to take care of you. But I pushed him off of you before he could have did anything. She said my aunt had called the police. My mom and dad were fighting and they shot him and he died that day. There was a girl named Jessica Phillips that went missing in my high school. She went missing in the middle of our junior year. When her parents came out about it, the school put posters up everywhere, alerts on the news. Two weeks later, they decorated her locker. Ever so often, I see her closest friend weeping during class, and the teachers would excuse them out. The devotion of love she was getting after she went missing was outstanding. But the thing is, no one liked Jessica. Actually, everyone hated her. Don't get me wrong, she was the most popular girl in school, but she was an asshole. She was very nasty and rude and did anything to get what she wanted. 
I heard she once gave this boy Ronnie peanuts for not doing her homework anymore. He wanted to get into sports and didn't have time for it. And he was allergic to peanuts. The girl was practically a bully. Her friends were all followers that secretly hated her but wanted to be her. But it's crazy to see them all crying over her whereabouts when they all wanted her gone. But I know why she went missing. Come back for part two. So the night Jessica went missing, I saw exactly what happened. She tried to sneak into Nicole's party, but she actually didn't get in. Not only because she wasn't invited, but she had got pulled into the bushes. When I ran to see where she was pulled, she was dragged by two guys into the streets. I was in shock and I stood there for a few seconds, but those few seconds, Jessica saw me. She screamed for me to help her, but I just stood there. I threw her into a car and drove off. I went back to the party as though nothing happened. After the party was over, I went back home and I kept replaying what happened over and over. Then that next Wednesday is when everyone started hearing about Jessica going missing. They said if anyone ever saw anything to come forward, but I decided not to. There were moments throughout the week where I felt like I should say something, but there were times that I felt like it was too late. I thought maybe she was dead by now and it'd be pointless for me to come out now, but everything changed when I got a message from a block number saying, why didn't you save me? During Halloween, someone asked me if I ever had a paranormal experience, and I told them no because I was in disbelief of ghosts, and I was actually going through paranormal things at my house for years. I denied it to keep calm, but now that I moved, I feel comfortable enough to speak on the creepy things that went down. So back in 1995, my dad had passed away, and my mom felt very uncomfortable being in our house, so we moved closer to family. I believe at the time I had to be 7, 8 and my brother was a teenager. The new house we moved in was very cold. Not just physically, but in a sense emotionally cold. Well, that's how it felt to me. The floors cracked every time you walked and the doors would make squeak noises. The first week my brother would play around my door and scare me, but one night in the middle of the night, I get a knock on my door. I ignored it thinking it was my brother and then I heard another knock and it woke me up. I got up to tell my brother to leave me alone. But when I opened up the door, there was nobody there. Come back for part two. Part two of my paranormal experience. So if you don't believe in unknown spirits, you can skip this. So like I said earlier, when I opened my door, nobody was there. I ran to my brother's room. He was asleep, so it was no way it was him. Next morning, I told my mom about it. And she assured me that ghosts weren't real. Anyways, a month later, weird things started happening to me. I started waking up in weird areas. The corner of my floor, the bathroom, and even my brother's room. He started to get weirded out and thought I was doing it on purpose, but I told him I didn't know how I got there. So that night, I begged him to stay in his room because I was scared. The next morning, I woke up to my brother staring at me. He said, I think you sleepwalk, but you weren't really walking. You more so was dragging yourself. I saw you trying to leave the room. I called you and asked where you were going, but you weren't responding. And then... You started floating in the air. I know this all sounds really crazy, but I'll explain it in part three. Part three of my paranormal experience. So my brother told me that I was sleepwalking and then I started floating in the air. My stomach dropped and I felt so scared. Then in the middle of me fearing my own body, my brother bust out laughing. I asked him, what's funny? He was like, I was messing with you and I moved towards him and pushed him for scaring me like that. He was like, I had to. You were so scared. And then I laid back in the bed so relieved. But then he said, you didn't float, but you definitely were sleepwalking. It explains why you wake up in my room. I was slightly confused because I've never walked in my sleep. Heck, I didn't even know sleepwalking was a real thing. I thought it was just something that they did in the movies. That day when my mom got back from work, I told her and she agreed to take me to the doctors one of these days. After a couple weeks, I completely stopped popping up in weird places, meaning I stopped sleepwalking. At least that's what I thought. I thought this whole paranormal thing was in my head until I had a near-death experience. But something saved me and I'll explain it in part four. Part four of my paranormal experience, a couple months later when I started school, I started having dreams about my dad. It'd be him preparing me for school, home, making me lunch, helping me pick out clothes, but then I'd wake up from the dream and I realized that he wasn't actually there. It really saddened me and it kept happening. 
I'd have that same dream over and over, and it went on for weeks. Then suddenly, I had a dream that the house we used to live in caught on fire, but in this dream, I could see myself, which felt weird. My dad had got up and started waking everyone up and telling them to go outside and leave. But when he got to me, I wasn't waking up. He kept shaking me to wake up. I'd think he'd pick me up to take me outside, but he was seriously just shaking me to wake up. He started crying, and I've never seen my dad cry, just telling me to please wake up. Then he screamed at me and said, wake up. And the scream was so loud that it actually woke me out of my dream. When I opened my eyes, I must have been sleepwalking because I was one step away from falling down the stairs. Story time on how I catfished my boyfriend to see if he would cheat on me. So around the time I had to be like 15, 16 and my boyfriend, he was probably like 17 because he was about two years older than me. Everything in our relationship seemed fine, but he was very secretive. For one, he never let me touch his phone. He would always make sure anytime he put his phone down, the screen was face downward, or he'd put it in his pocket or just hide it. Anytime I asked to use his phone, maybe to call someone, he'd be like, no. I knew that there was something going on that he wasn't telling me, so I created a fake Snapchat account. I found pictures of this really pretty girl on Instagram and I used all her pictures and I'd post stories here and there and then I decided to reach out to him and he literally responded in like five minutes. I said, hey, do you have a girlfriend? And you're not going to believe his response. Come back for part two on how I catfished my boyfriend to see if he would cheat on me. So like I said, I reached out to him and he responded immediately. I asked him, hey, do you got a girlfriend? And he responded right now that he's just talking to people, but he didn't clarify inside of any of the messages that he had a girl. Then I started thinking, maybe he thinks that our relationship is like still in talking stage. So I didn't get too mad until I asked him if he wanted to go out, like go out on a date, he asked me where I would like the date, and I told him I'd like to meet him at a movie theater. And like for a good week, we're sitting there flirting, and we're planning out our date. Now, the whole time of us planning out the date, when the day came, I didn't really expect to see him. But when I walked up to the corner of the movie theater, he was standing outside. Come back for part three. Part three on how I catfished my boyfriend to see if he would cheat on me. So I peek beside the movie theater and I see him standing outside. I was seriously heartbroken that he was going to meet up with the catfish. And I had him sitting there waiting. I was texting him through Snapchat telling him, oh, I'm a bit late. And I literally had him sitting there for two hours. Also, during this whole process of him waiting, also went ahead and got food and came back. After a couple minutes, he was like, he was just going to leave. By then, I had popped up at the movie theater and asked him, what are you doing here? And he responded, oh, I just got done seeing the movie. I was like, why didn't you tell me you went to the movie theaters? Maybe I could have came with you. Then he was like, no, I just wanted to go by myself. Then I pulled up my phone, showed him a picture of the girl I was catfishing, and asked him, was this your date? Then he pretended to not know who that was, and then I showed him our messages. When he found out it was me the whole time, he got mad at me and broke up. Story time on how my best friend faked her death. By the way, we're going to call her Amanda, and we were both 16 at the time. Going through high school, Amanda got bullied a lot. She didn't necessarily know how to defend herself, so I would always find myself defending her all the time. And I had no problem doing it because that was my closest friend. We were like sisters, and we grew up together. And people bullied her about her nose being too big and her acne. Just really mean stuff. There was this one time the mean girls at our school literally threw pizza at her face to tell her that that's what her face looks like. And I will always try to help her with her confidence. But I noticed me being around her all the time, I started to get bullied. And people would always attack me about hanging out with her. But don't worry, I'd always handle myself. But it got to a point where it was just overly done. So one day I just wanted to see a test of what would happen if I didn't talk to her for the day or hang out with her. And the next day, she disappeared. Come back for part two. Part two on how my best friend faked her death. 
So, like I said, I started to get bullied for hanging around her. So, I wanted to try and see what would happen if I decided not to really hang out with her for a day. And the next day, she disappeared. So, the day she wasn't at school, I went back home and called her. Her mom picked up and I asked her if she was there. Her mom said, no, I thought that she was with you. So, that night, Amanda never came home. So the next day, her mom had told me that she was going to go to the police station and file a missing persons report. But she was told she couldn't really file one because the person had to be missing for at least 72 hours to be considered missing. And I felt so scared because she's never missing. She never ups and leaves. And I started to believe it was because the day I stopped talking to her and I was blaming myself for her being gone. And I was hoping that she wasn't kidnapped. But come back for part three if you want to know what happened. Part three on how my best friend faked her own death. So Amanda was missing for a week. Her mom had came to the school to let them know that if they ever saw her come by to please let her know or to please call the police. And during this whole time, a lot of people were coming up to me asking me what happened to her. And of course, I had to tell them that I didn't know because I didn't. But all I could hope is that she was safe and alive. There was a few students that laughed about her being missing, but there was a few students that cared. So I was asking people to put up posters. Around this time, social media wasn't really out, so we couldn't necessarily post anything online. Everything went on polls. Amanda was also in the news. And every day I cried hoping that she would come back. After two weeks of her being gone, I get a letter from Amanda and I'm so shocked because I'm like, oh my gosh, where is she? And it was a suicide letter. Come back. Part four on how my best friend faked their own death. So I got a letter in the mail and it was from Amanda. I was so shocked about the letter. I opened it up really quickly. When I read it, I found out that it was a suicide letter and I just sat there and cried. I had went to her house and knocked on the door to let her mom know, but her mom also received the same letter. After a couple days, her mom did have the police do another search and no one could find her. I was hoping maybe she didn't commit suicide in a place that we could never find her. I don't know, but it just didn't feel right and how she just left off this way. Her mom just couldn't believe it. So a couple months I would stay inside her mom's house I sleep over, sleep inside of her room, just grieving her being lost. But I couldn't believe that she committed suicide. I didn't believe that she was dead and neither did her mom. Deep down, I knew that she was somewhere out there. Come back for part five. Part five on how my best friend faked her death. So after two years of Amanda being missing, even though she wrote those letters to us, we both still didn't believe that she was gone. And I thought about her just about every day. During these years, her mom would constantly do searches. Maybe if she wasn't alive, then maybe they could find her body. Then maybe then she would find the truth. Her mom couldn't accept the fact that maybe she was dead. And every week on Sunday, she go out there even by herself. My mom and a few of her friends would always tell her she can't keep doing that. She'll even sometimes go out in the middle of the night, walk around calling for her. And her mom started to get really sick. After the third year of her being gone, her dad finally came inside the picture. Amanda was never really close with her dad. He wasn't really a part of her life. He started to see how mentally ill her mother was becoming, so he decided to set up a funeral so this all could end. But her mom didn't want to attend. Come back for part six. Part six on how my best friend faked her death. So her dad wanted to set up the funeral so they could finally end this grieving. Her mom didn't want to attend because she didn't believe that she was dead and still, I still couldn't believe it either. Her dad read the note and he wanted them both to stop all this pain. After a couple months battling out of doing a funeral, he finally did one. And I started thinking, maybe she is gone because maybe then I could let go of this whole situation. So of course me and my family attended the funeral. I mean, of course they had no body to bury but they did set up a grave and they put her stone in the ground so after 11 years of that happening i believe that she was dead i had moved to texas met my husband which i married and i got pregnant 
maybe four months into my pregnancy, I wanted to take mommy classes. And when I got there, the instructor looked like Amanda's mom. Part 7 on how my best friend faked her death. I got pregnant and I wanted to start taking mommy classes. When I had got to the class, the instructor looked like Amanda's mom, but almost like a younger virgin. When I looked at her face even closer, she had the same mold that Amanda had down the bottom of her chin. And then I snapped. That's Amanda. When I walked up to her and said, Amanda, she looked at me and froze. After she stared at me for five seconds, a girl comes up to her and says, Mom. I looked over and gasped. After she talked with her daughter, there was more and more women coming in for the class. And once I realized it was her, I ran back to my car. When I got to my car, I started to have a panic attack because that was her. And the daughter that called for her had to be maybe 12 or 13 years old. And I started to think, in order for Amanda to have a 12-year-old now, she would have to have gotten pregnant months before she went missing.